as a pastor to, um, to protect against false teaching and questionable theo theology, uh, there are those that try to propagate this understanding that cats are going to be in heaven. And I take this very serious. Um, but I got to say, I'm giving credence to the possibility of something like this because of the following true story. This happened to a minister of a church and uh, he had gotten uh, himself a kitten. The kitten climbed up a tree in his yard. The tree was not a very large tree, but it uh, wasn't sturdy enough for him to climb and the cat was too high for it to come down. He tried coaxing it down, offering milk. The kitten would not come down for anything. So uh, he thought, I'll tie a rope to the tree put the rope on the back of my car, pull the tree down so that I can reach the kitten. Uh, that's what he did. So he's, he's in his car and he's looking as he's going forward just a little bit and he, he's getting the tree kind of at that point of tension and, and he's, he's wanting that to be so he can just walk over and grab the kitten out of the tree. But he went so far that the rope snapped and it went back upright and it literally flung the cat just out of sight into his neighborhood. And so the, the, the minister was just absolutely devastated that this had occurred. And he went all over the neighborhood, house to house, asking people, have you seen a kitten? Have you seen a kitten? Nobody had seen a kitten. And uh, he just finally, really heartbroken, genuinely, just prayed to God, God, I commit this little kitten into your care. Um, I, I, I don't know what else to do. And he went on about his business. Well, a few days later, he's at the grocery store. And he met one of his church members. And he happened to look into her shopping cart, and she had uh, a whole bunch of cat food. And he was kind of amazed because this woman, like me, uh, didn't necessarily care for cats. And um, he asked her, why are you buying cat food? You don't like cats. And she replied, Pastor, you're, you're not going to believe this. And she told him that, her little girl has been absolutely begging him for a cat, but she kept refusing. And uh, the, the kid kept begging. And, and finally she said, I'll tell you what, you go pray. And if God gives you a cat, we'll keep it. So she's, she says, Pastor, you will not believe what happened. She went out. I watched this with my own eyes. She went out in the backyard, got down on her knees, and she started praying to God for a cat. And I, I tell you, I saw this with my own eyes. A cat literally, with its paws out, dropped right in front of her <laughs> in the yard. Now, I'm not sure if that proves that cats are going to be in heaven or if heaven is getting rid of cats. But... Um, most people don't think of animals as being from heaven. Now, if you were here last week, you, you learned that my view of heaven is not necessarily typical of most. And it seems to me that that uh, typical Christian view is to think of heaven as a bunch of invisible spirits in an invisible place floating around in fog and on clouds. Even less likely in the minds of most people is this idea of anything from heaven coming down to earth. And I want you to be prepared to have your minds expanded and some long-held notions challenged. What if we don't go up to heaven? What if heaven comes down to us? Open up your Bibles to Revelation 21. At the end of this vision that John was given, he writes these words in Revelation 21, beginning in the first verse. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. This, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain. 
for the old order of things has passed away. This morning, I want to introduce you to a concept that you have heard most of your life. You've probably uh, gone to church most of your life and heard about this, but you've probably never heard a single sermon on this particular topic. I want to talk to you today about the new earth. What is it? Throughout our Bibles, the promised future for God's people is not a non-earth, but a new earth. Just as man was made from the earth, man was made for the earth. Isaiah 45, verse 18, which was read at the beginning of our worship service, for this is what the Lord says, He who created the heavens, He is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, He founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. God's purpose was to live in intimate fellowship with man on a good, curse-free earth. In the beginning, that is exactly how it was. He would come in the cool of the day, and he would walk, and he would talk with man. Now, we know that man sinned, and theologically we call that the fall. Everything has been different since that point in time. But did the fall cause God to abandon his original purpose? You go back in Genesis, and you will see that Eden was never destroyed. What was destroyed was man's ability to live in Eden. And man has been homesick for Eden ever since. And so you have this longing for the world where men and God are right again, alluded to all throughout the prophets. They, they foretell a world that will once again be what God intended it to be. The prophets predict the ultimate restoration project. Well, what do they mean by that? Peter tells us. Uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit as, as he preaches literally the very first Bible or gospel sermon in Acts 3 verse 21. He says, He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Notice that Peter does not say that Jesus will be in heaven until the time comes for God to destroy everything. That's what I grew up believing. I, I think that that is what most Christians believe, but that is not what the Holy Spirit says. Jesus will remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything. You remember when the rich young ruler leaves Jesus, walks away, and he's sad, and all the disciples say, well, what about us? We've left everything to follow you. And Jesus responds to them in Matthew 19, verse 28. I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. You see, there was some basis for the expectation from the Jews that when the Messiah came, he would establish an earthly kingdom because there were all of these prophecies that, that were about the world being set right again. Now, there is a basis for the premillennialist position of the earth being set right. Now, I'm not a premillennialist, but I understand how that position came into being because you have all of this literature in our Bible about the world being set right again, about wolves laying down with lambs and children playing beside the nest of a cobra. And the Bible says the prophets foretold all of these things. Of, and they talked about the renewal of, of all things. Look with me at the prophet Isaiah. And I want you to see just how much this sounds like the book of Revelation. Isaiah 65, verses 17 through 19. It says this, Behold, I will create a new, heaven, or a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people to be a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no 
more. These and other prophecies are, are too grand to just be talking about the return of the exiles. This was the renewal of all things that the prophets foretold. Now, what we have traditionally done, especially if you are of all millennial persuasion, theologically speaking, we in the Churches of Christ typically have held that position for years, is we read the prophecies and we spiritualize them. We, we make them figurative. Well, that, that doesn't mean what it sounds like, we'll say. That's just spiritual language. And, it, and it's funny to me when you read through the prophets like that, and that kind of view comes into being because... Just a few chapters earlier, when Isaiah predicts the first coming of Jesus in chapter 53, we take that very literally. But when he talks about the second coming of Jesus, we tend to take all of that figuratively. The doctrine of the new earth does not just rest on speculation of Old Testament prophecy or interpretation of John's vision and revelation. It rests on clear apostolic teaching. Open up your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3, and I want you to keep it there for me for a little bit. 2 Peter 3. Peter is dealing with the tension that Christians are feeling about their preaching that Jesus is going to come back someday, and the scoffer who says, oh yeah, well he hasn't come back yet, so where is he? Look at 2 Peter 3 with me, beginning in verse 3. It says, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They're going to say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. <clears throat> but they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord. A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare." Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. We are to be eagerly awaiting a new earth. The prophets predicted it. John saw a vision of it and, and, and Revelation, and Peter preached on this. Well, where is it going to be? You're on it. Keep listening. I don't believe that God's original plan was a failed experiment. I believe that the next coming of our Lord Jesus will bring about the complete redemption of everything under the curse, including creation. Read with me again a passage we looked at last week from Romans chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. It says, For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present moment. How can creation hope if annihilation is its future? And I, I want to be very careful here because last week uh, I, I opened up this topic and I want to handle this, I think, in the right way, in the correct way as I divide God's word carefully on this. 
But doesn't the pains of childbirth suggest that creation has a future? Did God make our earth just so that it could be incinerated? Now, because there are a lot of sharp Bible students here, I, I know some of you are thinking, well, Peter says everything's going to be destroyed by fire, right? Good question. Fire does not annihilate matter. It gives it a new form. I do not believe the fire that destroys the earth when Jesus comes back is going to be punitive. It is going to be purgative. It will cleanse our earth. Now let me give you some reasons, and these are worth writing down. I know this is heavy, but I think this is going to be very exciting when we get to the end. Here is the first reason that I believe this earth is the new earth once it is cleansed by fire. First, there are two different words for new. Forgive me for going into the Greek, but this is very important. This is really where it does matter. One word that's used for uh, time in the Bible is the word neos, and it literally means brand new. It means that it's never existed before. It's new. It's never been. The other word is kainos. There's neos and kainos. Kainos means new in quality. It's not referencing something that's never existed before. It's referencing something that has been completely changed. Like when a woman says, hey, come and look at my new kitchen. She's not saying it's brand new in the sense that it's never existed. It's new in the sense that it's been transformed. It's new in quality. Look at Revelation 21, verse 5. It says, He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. That is the word kainos, new in quality. A better example, I think, though, out of Scripture is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. That is the word kainos. When you become a Christian, you do not become a human being that has never existed before. You are the same person with a totally new quality about you because of the Holy Spirit's work inside of you. So when he says a new earth, he does not mean one that has never existed before. It means one that has been changed. But let me give you another argument as why I believe this earth will be the new earth. Second, it is compared to the effects of the flood. As we read in 2 Peter chapter 3, he says, don't you remember the first time that God did this? And notice the word that he used. Look at verse 6 in 2 Peter 3. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. That word destroyed did not mean that the earth disappeared. It means that when he destroyed the earth by water, he completely ridded the earth of everything evil so that it could be repopulated with his righteous children. And that is the same word he uses when he says that the world is going to be destroyed by fire. He's going to prepare the earth to be re-inhabited by his sons and his daughters. Another argument for me is this, that it is compared to the redemption of our bodies. We discussed this last Sunday. Paul makes this comparison in Romans chapter 8. God is going to raise up our bodies. It is going to be us, but it's going to be us gloriously new and different. The same groaning that we grow, go through, the creation itself goes through as well. The same hope that we have in the resurrection is the same hope that the creation has as well. And he's going to do the same thing for creation that he does for you and for me. Everything affected by the curse is going to be redeemed. Ironically, our hymns have been teaching us these things principles for many, many years. 300 years ago, Isaac Watts wrote his famous Christmas song, No more let sin or sorrow reign or thorns infest the ground. He makes his blessings flow far as the curse is found. This has always been the promise. One more argument for me is simply that God will not let Satan win the battle for the earth. 
If God must completely destroy his original creation, then at one level it could be said that the devil had the last word. But he doesn't get the last word. God is the ultimate salvage artist. What he did for you, what he did for me, he's going to do for creation. God takes things that sin polluted and perverted. And not only does God make it new, God makes it better than new. So I believe the heaven that now is will one day make a dramatic move to earth. It's interesting, all through the Bible, you have, you have heaven and you have earth as these two separate entities, but you get to the 21st chapter of Revelation and the dualism ends, and at that point on, heaven and earth are the same thing. They are one. Now, that's what I think. Is this a salvation doctrine? No. Do you have to be right on this to go to heaven? No. You have to be right on Jesus. You don't have to be right on what heaven is going to be like. And by the way, when I go to heaven, if it doesn't exactly turn out like I have, you know, very exhaustively and completely figured out for you, then I'm not going to say, it's not like I thought. I don't want to be here. That's not what I'm going to say. But this is what I believe heaven will be. And like I said, I want to tell you in a minute why I'm excited about this. But, but let me answer this question. How will it be, be like or unlike the old earth? Because there will be some continuity and there will be some discontinuity. It will be unlike our old earth in many ways. For one thing, John said in Revelation, there will be no more sea. Now, I hate to ruin some of your favorite heaven songs about singing by the crystal sea. But you go back and you read Revelation, the sea is where the evil beast came from. The sea was a symbol in the Hebrew mind for evil. Do you realize that our earth currently is only about 10% habitable? When you, when you take away what is covered with the sea and what is covered with desert and what is covered with mountain ranges and what is covered with ice caps, You've only got about 10% of our globe that you can live on. I don't believe that is how this original earth looked. I believe the flood changed everything. I believe that the new earth is going to be an earth, an earth that can hold life all over the globe. There will not be any procreation on the new earth. We're, we're going to talk about that more next week, but Jesus said there will not be marriage. That's, that's a difference. In the first earth, we were told to multiply, but in the second earth, there's not going to be any multiplying. And next Sunday, we're going we're gonna to discuss some very difficult questions like if there's not any marriage in heaven, well, what about the relationship I had here on earth with my mate? And what about uh, my kids or other loved ones who actually don't go to heaven? What about that? But here is the main way that I think that this earth and the new earth will be different. The main difference is in this earth and the new earth is that the curse will be removed. And we have no idea just how big that is. Some of you are wrestling right now with more than thinking that heaven is, is up in the clouds somewhere. The, the earth is so fallen. We just saw this. We woke up to the news of how fallen and broken our world is. We are conditioned to this. We're wearied by this. And, and we equate heaven with an escape from this. I want to get away from all of this. I don't want to come back to this. I want to be rid of this. And you know what? I, I don't think that we would have any objection if we ever had seen Eden. And one day we will. But the new earth will be like this earth in, in some ways. In some ways, one of them is that we're going to engage all of our senses. Heaven is going to be something where we delight in all of our senses by feeling and tasting and smelling and hearing and touching. Heaven is not going to be one long, giant church service that never ends. We're going to work. That's right. You will work in heaven. You will play, you will learn, 
You will spend time with friends. You will eat in heaven, not as a function to survive, but God made these bodies to enjoy food. As I began the study, I was amazed at how often they refer to food when they talk about heaven in Scripture. The prophets do this over and over, but just stick to the New Testament. Jesus told the church in Ephesus that they would eat from the tree of life, which has 12 kinds of fruit, and it's always blooming. He told the church in Revelation 2, verse 17, that he would give that church some of the hidden manna. Revelation 19, verse 9, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. But I think one of the neatest of all is that Jesus has a table. At the Last Supper, Jesus spoke to his disciples, said, this is my body holding bread, and, and this, is, this is my blood holding bread the cup of wine. He said, and I won't drink it with you again until you sit at my table in the kingdom of God. You know, every good party has good food. And there are going to be a lot of parties in heaven. So heaven is going to be fun. And I'll tell you something else. And, and this is something that my wife and I have debated but there are going to be animals in heaven. Just as the prophets announced, when God created this perfect world for us to live in and fellowship with Him, one of the delights that He put into this world for us was to love and take care of animals. God seems to have a special affection for animal life. Notice in the Genesis account that He, he did not ask Adam to name plants. He asked Adam to name the animals. He had Noah save the animals. Go back to the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath day. It was not just for men, but the Sabbath was also to make a provision for rest for animals as well. Remember the end of the book of Jonah, and Jonah is having that big pity party for himself, and God says that city, Nineveh, has 120,000 people, and they don't even know their right hand from their left hand, and a whole lot of cattle. God was basically saying, Jonah, should I destroy all these people and all those cows just because you're in a bad mood? The Bible even commands animals to praise God. Psalm 150 verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I believe there will be animals in heaven, including extinct species, species that we have never seen, possibly even new life forms that you can't even possibly comprehend. I'm still not quite sure about cats, <laughs> but I am sure of this. God has both the power and the desire to prepare for us a perfect home. Do you believe that? I want to I wanna have us just pray together at the, the conclusion here of this message and, and thank God for this amazing place that we've been talking about. Lord, we just thank you.